Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at a little Italian pistol caliber bullpup. This is an Algimac AGM-1. Uh, came out of Italy, Milan specifically, in the mid-late 1980s, uh, and was developed by a guy named Alfonso Giambelli, and that's the A-L and G-I of Algimac. Uh, now, some of these came into the US. My understanding is that some came in fully marked, and there are some photographs out there showing markings right clearly in large font on the side. Uh, however, apparently a lot of the ones in the United States were actually assembled here from parts that were imported, and they have almost no markings on them, and this is one of those. Now, this particular one is chambered for 9mm Parabellum. But they were advertised in a wide variety of cartridges. Uh, 9 Parabellum, 45 ACP, 45 HP, an Italian not quite the same as 45 ACP cartridge that was used to get around Italy's, at the time, prohibition on military cartridges in civilian ownership. Uh, 9 by 21 millimeter, also for use in Italy because it wasn't a military cartridge. 22 Rimfire, 22 uh, WRM, 22 Magnum Rimfire. Like a whole bunch of cartridges. Now it's not clear to me how many of those varieties were actually manufactured versus advertised, because advertising something as being available in a variety of calibers is a pretty common thing for a manufacturer. You put out the advertisements and then if you get some orders, especially a big order from a wholesaler, then you actually make it in that caliber. But if you don't get the orders then, well, you never bother actually producing the guns. So the only ones that I'm 100% sure were actually made are the 9mm ones. 9x19 for the US market, and 9x21 in Italy. Uh, so uh, it is of course a bullpup, it is a simple blowback system. This is like 27 inches long with, uh, including this muzzle brake device, uh, almost an 18 inch barrel. So it's right basically at the minimums of what's legally allowable in the US uh, for overall length without becoming a short barreled rifle. Anyway, let's go ahead and pull it apart and I'll show you how it works. On the Italian made examples of this, it will say Algamac AGM-1 in big letters right up here. However, like I said, a lot of them apparently were assembled from parts in the US and they don't have any of those markings. Instead, we have a pair of serial numbers here, uh, one on the lower frame, which theoretically ought to be the legal receiver in the US because it's the part that holds the magazine, as you see there, and a matching number on the upper assembly. Uh, the only other markings we have are here on the underside of the muzzle, rather crudely hand-scribed on there, AGM-1 9mm Algamac Italy, and POC DCNV. That's all the information that we would normally expect from an import mark uh, it's not clear to me who POC is. Um, the only DC that I can come up with in Nevada is Douglas County. Um, normally DC would be the abbreviation for a city, but as far as I can tell there are no cities in Nevada that have the initials DC. So that's a bit of a mystery to me still. So let's move on to some of the mechanics. Uh, it's pretty simple. We have a simple blowback bolt here with a charging handle up there. So the charging handle is fixed into the bolt, you'll see that when we take it apart. Uh, so it does reciprocate when you fire. There is a cross bolt safety here. That is very simple. In this position it allows you to fire because the trigger can go back. When I push it across there is now a block that the trigger hits. So trigger can't pull, gun can't fire. The magazine well, being a bullpup, is located behind the grip. Uh, we have a release button here push that, it's actually just a screw head, push that in and you can pull out the magazine. Now this is a Browning high power magazine body, however it has an extra notch cut in the back of the top. So this is a standard Browning high power magazine here. You can see the difference. If you try to use a regular high power magazine, uh, the, the bolt face hits on this section of the magazine and that's why it has to have a cutout. Now you can see here that the magazine assembly, the magazine well, is a separate component there uh, that can be interchanged. And so that's how this would have been uh, assembled theoretically in multiple different calibers, is by simply replacing the magazine well assembly. 
Uh, and you can see that it's big enough there to give enough space for a 45 caliber double stack magazine if they wanted to do that. You've got extra space in the back if you need it for a, a later design, that sort of thing. Disassembly is fairly straightforward. We have one pin here that we can push out. There are some spring detents in this, but it is not captive. Uh, and if you have that spring detent in place, you can't pull it apart. Once that pin is out, then we can just pivot the whole thing open. The recoil spring retention is uh, actually kind of clever, although also kind of unnecessary. Uh, so to get rid, to take this out, what we're going to do is push this back and then drop it down. There we go. So it's a little retainer retaining plate here that has a lip at the top that hooks into this slot and a lip, a bigger lip at the bottom that hooks behind this plate and just holds the recoil spring assembly in place. Now that spring is actually self-contained and we just pull it out the back of the bolt assembly there. Then we come up here to the top of the gun. We're going to take this, the charging handle, rotate it 90 degrees and it will get that rotated right. There we go. And then that lifts out of the gun. And because it's long enough, there is a hole cut in the carry handle up here. Uh, the carry handle, kind of like an AR, is not really a carry handle. It is a guard for the charging handle, which is going to be reciprocating back and forth. At any rate, you pull this out. You can see right here, the front of the recoil spring assembly goes into the charging handle to lock it in place so it can't come out while you're using the gun. And now we can pull the bolt out. This is uh, in the fashion of you know the, the more modern submachine guns. This is a telescoping bolt, so you've got the whole thing solid with the exception of a hole down there for the recoil spring. Um, this is a lot of mass, and it all telescopes forward so that you can have the, the breech, the the action of the gun relatively close to the back end of the receiver. It does have a spring-loaded firing pin. Other than that, there's really nothing going on in here. This is hammer-fired. We've got our fire control group back here behind the magazine. There is a connecting rod from the trigger right up there that comes all the way back. Note, we have an out-of-battery safety here, so if this is pushed down, uh, which happens when the bolt's not fully in battery. If that's pushed down, the hammer can't release, so it can't fire out of battery. And there's the rest of your trigger linkage back to here. There's a coil spring for the hammer in the bottom. Pretty simple. Now the one other thing that we can do here is loosen this set screw a bit, and then we can take off the two locking nuts on the barrel. This one, by the way, is beveled at the back to force the barrel to properly center in the barrel tube, because this is actually a, a rather easily removable barrel. This is just the tube that holds it in place and connects to the front sight block. So with the barrel nuts removed and that set screw loosened. I can actually pop the barrel clear out of the gun. And it's just got a collar back here. Um, so it gets pushed into all the way into the trunnion here, and then locked in place with that set screw right there. So there's your cut for the extractor. That bridge uh, sets you know, where it sets the spacing on the barrel, and away you go. <laughs> a little bit of a spoiler alert, I had not actually taken the barrel out before I started filming, and when I did here, uh, it is marked Silver Bullet DC NV, which actually doesn't really help me at all, because um, I just shut off the camera a moment, did a quick bit of Google searching, and I cannot find a Silver Bullet located in a DC Nevada. There is a Silver Bullet in Sparks, which I don't think is related to this. This is probably a company that went out of business like 30 years ago.
Anyway, uh, there's the front of the gun with the barrel removed. So this is really a nothing tube. What this does do is allow you to uh, properly align the front sight block here. So it's on the barrel, and it's just held in place by a pair of set screws on the bottom. That would be something that would be rather tricky to keep perfectly vertical and keep your sights aligned. And so instead they added a tube up here, and if you've got those two tubes both fixed to the receiver they allow you to set the position on this fairly well. Um, I realized I didn't talk about the sights. We've got a just plain round post there. It is threaded into the front sight block, so you can screw that in or out to adjust elevation. And then the rear sight is kind of an M16A1-ish uh, two-position aperture. We've got windage adjustment as a screw on the side. There is also a hole right up here in the charging handle cover slash carry handle, uh, which I am told will actually mount the uh, uh, carry handle scope mount for an AR-15 slash M16. Uh, apparently it fits it fairly well, however I suspect the downside of doing that is it would probably cover uh, the hole back here, which would make it impossible to disassemble the gun or to take the bolt out if you had the scope mount still on there. So. Uh, that is the Algamac AGM-1 9mm bullpup carbine. Quick note about the serial number here, you will see some places reference that only a hundred of these were made. Well I've seen serial numbers as low as, well in the double digits, which tells me they did not start at 100. Uh, here of course we have 144, this suggests to me that they started at number 1 or maybe number 10, uh, and there's probably more like 150 of these that came into the US, uh, or were made and serialized in this way. Allegedly these were originally developed for sale to Italian law enforcement and military organizations. That never happened, probably because everyone, every law enforcement agency in Italy was very happy with its Beretta Model 12s. And I should say I haven't actually found evidence of an original full auto one, so the exact details of this I'm not really sure on. At any rate, they were marketed commercially as semi-auto only carbines to the Italian and American commercial markets, uh, and this is mid-late 1980s. Now this did run afoul of some of the US assault weapons import regulations. It's interesting to me that despite uh, how uncommon of a gun it is, how very few of them actually came into the country, it did come to the attention of various legislative groups because the Algamec is listed by name in a number of pieces of assault weapons prohibition law, like New Jersey's state ban for instance, uh, specifically prohibiting this gun by name. So there aren't usually, it, those lists are kind of interesting if you look at them forensically in terms of like how did the people writing the legislation know about these specific guns and not some ones that aren't listed and well really rare unusual stuff like this that is listed. Uh, similar thing, the, uh, the HKG-11 is listed specifically by name as being prohibited in Canada. Not like there was a big risk of HKG-11s coming into Canada in the first place. Anyway, I digress. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed a chance to take a look at this guy and take it apart. Thanks for watching.